Perhaps may we good morning to everyone who is able to be here this morning and those who are watching over the, our Facebook live stream. We welcome you to this time of worshiping the Lord together as God's people. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalms 29. Ascribe to the Lord, ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship him, worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters, the God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forests bare. In his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the people of the Lord give strength, or may the Lord give strength to his people. Those are wonderful, encouraging words spoken to us from the psalmist, and the words remind us of the very first pages of the scripture, of the creation account, where the Spirit of God is brooding over the tohu wabohu is the actual, I think, Hebrew word. It's, it's just a mess. It's just nothing has yet materialized into something that is visible for us in the beauty that we have before today. And out of this nothingness, out of that material that was there over which God's Spirit was brooding, He brought forth the earth and He spoke. And because He is our Creator, because He spoke everything into existence, we too can in join in with the worship of all of creation, giving him honor this morning. Our opening song this morning is, Great is Thy Faithfulness. It'll be a recording, but uh, if you know the song, we encourage you to play along with it.
thank you, Father, that we can join in with the voices of millions around the world who know you as their faithful Lord and Savior, the one who created them, the one who sustains them, the one who redeemed them. And we thank you together of your faithfulness, that we can absolutely depend upon you. You are not like shifting sand. You are like solid rock beneath our feet. We know of your goodness, we know of your kindness, we know of your love for us. And may we be again reminded of that today, even when things around us are going in so many different directions and there are a discouraging news to be heard wherever we look. But Lord, we choose today as your people to put our trust in you. No matter how much noise is there around us, we are certain of that one fact that you are a rock upon whom we are building our house and therefore it will stand. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your strength, for being with us even in the hard times that we go through. And Lord, this morning as we come to you to honor you, we pray that our sound, even our feeble voices, may be heard and they may be a sweet sound to your ears. We thank you that we can put our trust in uncertain times in you. We do not want to fail to lift up those who are in special need this morning, Lord, for those who are sick, especially those who are dealing with infections by the virus that has been upsetting our whole world. We ask that you would be near them. Uh, we pray that their symptoms will be, if any, minimal, and that they will quickly recuperate completely and without any after effects left. We remember those who are attending to those who are sick, whether it is family members, healthcare workers, other leaders of medicine and science, that they would rightly lead us. We thank you for the vaccines that have been developed and I pray that there will be a quick distribution of it so that all of us can enjoy uh, that safety from this virus. We thank you that you will lead and guide those who are making decisions about the distribution and how to do it quickly with innovative ideas so that they can get it done quickly for the safety and the good of all. Lord, we pray for those who have lost loved ones, for those who have lost loved ones from COVID, but also from other illnesses in recent times. Lord, we can only begin to imagine the pain and the grief that they are feeling. And so we ask you that you would be near them, that you would wrap your arms around them, and that you would comfort them and give them your peace. Whisper your sweet words of encouragement and comfort into their ears. Be present with them, that they feel your nearness like a warm blanket around them. Lord, we pray for those who are shut in, who are in care homes, who are unable to even receive visitors at this time, that you would be with them in this time of loneliness, and that as they are lonely, they may sense your presence in new ways, that they would know that you will never leave any one of us alone, that you will be with us. Lord, we pray for our schools and those who are in educational institutions, that they have wisdom to know how to plan things and how to conduct teachings and the school services in a way that is both helping to train the people, the young students, but also to keep them safe. We pray for our political leaders, Lord, especially all the things that we've been seeing on the news and the change of our administration. We are so sorry about the things that have we have seen on Wednesday, and we pray, Lord, that you would bring and restore order and that you would give wisdom to <clears throat> the authorities to know how to handle things. And help us to really look to you and to not engage in behavior that is wrong, no matter what our conviction may be, but that we would entrust ourselves into your hands. We pray for wisdom for the president-elect Biden and Vice President uh, Harris, that you would give them wisdom for the many challenges that they are facing so that they may lead our country in the right way, in godly ways. 
but we are also asking for our local, our tribal, our state governments that you would give them strength, especially those who have been newly elected to offices, but also those who have served for many years, that they, they may continue to serve in humility, with integrity, with wisdom, and with the heart of a servant. Lord, we are trusting ourselves into your hand. And we are saying that we are trusting that you will take care of us. You have promised us and you have spoken of yourself as the good shepherd who is willing to give his life. And not only willing, you actually gave your life for all your sheep. And therefore, we are able to trust you with our, our whole heart, no matter what may happen around us. Lord, we also remember especially uh, our elder Bessie Scott who recently passed on into your presence. It is a great loss along with all the other ones that <coughs> have been crossing over lately. But we want to especially thank you for Bessie because she has been teaching young and old the language of the Nimiku. And she has encouraged all of us in the churches as well to use our services and our prayers to use the language. She has taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer in your language and we pray that as we hear her voice now over the speakers that we may be touched by what she has taught us and that we may take it as something that will be instructive for all of us, that we will practice, not just out of rote repetition but with a heart to understand the words that you have spoken to us and to have this prayer be more meaningful in our lives. We thank you for Bessie. We pray for Scotty that you will be near him in this time where his beloved wife and companion is no longer with him. Grant them wisdom. Grant them strength, all the family, and let them sense your nearness with them. We thank you for all your goodness and your love for us. It is in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. We have a few announcements. We want to thank all of you for your continued giving, investing into God's work as we are functioning in different ways with uh, services at not at full capacity, but thankfully for those who are unable to be here, are able to watch over our live stream. So if you want to continue to make contributions, you know that you can mail them to First Indian Presbyterian Church, Care of Treasurer, P.O. Box 1, Kamiai, 83536. We want to be thankful for those who have already given and helped the work of God's church to continue on. Let's turn to uh, Nesper's hymn number 124. I will sing the wondrous story, number 124. We'll have to all sing loudly or otherwise our recording will only have static. <laughs> I 
Thank you, Chris. That was beautiful. Well, in our Christian calendar, this Sunday commemorates and remembers the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ. You remember last week uh, our pastor spoke to us about Epiphany, which is traditionally the time where the three magi, the three people from a foreign country, followed a star to come to worship Jesus, the newborn child, the newborn king. And now we are remembering the time when Jesus was already grown. This must be about 30 or so years later in the history. And there wasn't much that is told in the scriptures that happened between the time of Jesus' birth and the time where he began his ministry. But this is part of this time. One of the stories that you may remember is when Jesus was taken by his parents as a 12-year-old to the temple for their annual festivities and their annual celebrations and sacrifices that they brought at the temple and where Jesus uh, scared his parents pretty pretty good by remaining behind. And so as the parents were on their way home already, they noticed that he wasn't in the throng of people that were traveling. And so they had to return back to Jerusalem and they found him there with all the theologians and the scripture leaders and those who were wise in the eyes and esteemed in the eyes of the people of Israel. And he was asking them questions and interacting with them that they were just scratching their head. How can a 12 year old boy have this knowledge, have this wisdom. That's an inkling of the personality of Jesus that we see developing. But besides this and the story that we read about here, uh, about the baptism of Jesus, are only one of the few occurrences where we know something about his life in between of his birth and his beginning of his ministry. So let's read the verses, the, the verses from Mark chapter 4, uh, Mark chapter 1, verses 4 through 11, and then the other scripture given to us is from Acts chapter 19. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And from Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. And it happened that while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him. That is Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about twelve men in all. So here in the 
scripture that we read in Mark's Gospel, we are told that John was doing the job that had been prophesied about him by the prophet Isaiah, hundreds and hundreds of years before he was going to be born. The prophet Isaiah had said that there would be a voice in the wilderness, a voice that would proclaim the coming of the King, the coming of the Messiah. And so John was doing this. He was saying about, as we read about Jesus, the Lamb of God, that He is the one worthy, that He is the one who is so high and lifted up that He didn't even feel comfortable to untie the thongs of His sandals, which was probably the dirtiest job that anyone could ever have to do. So even the lowest thing John was not worthy of because he recognized the greatness, the majesty, the wonder of Jesus, the Son of God who had been born in the flesh and was growing up. And when John was pointing to Jesus, the coming of the Messiah, he was talking to the people to repent. The word that the Bible uses in the Greek here is metanoia, which means a change of mind, a change of thinking. In modern vernacular we might say to change our stinking thinking, to change our mind from what it is normally occupied with and look to the Lord. Where we have gone in the wrong direction, in ways that are displeasing to God, we change our mind first and say, no, this is not right. And by God's help we can turn away from that way of life and we can walk in obedience and following Him in the right direction. That is what John was preaching, and as an outward sign of those changed minds that he was seeing, John would take the people who would come to him who had repented, and he would baptize them. He would baptize them in the Jordan River. And although there are many ways of baptism, uh, we practice a particular one here, especially when it's children who are baptized, but I know that there are others who have also been baptized later in their life or older and who have probably experienced something very similar to what the people here experienced. They were immersed under the water. And that is what the word baptism actually means. It means dipping. It's almost like a garment that is being dipped into a fluid that will change the color of the garment. So the garment goes in looking one way, and when it comes out of the fluid that it has been dipped into, it will have a different color. The significance of baptism is saying, since we had a change of mind, since we have turned around from our wicked ways, from the ways that were displeasing to God, and now are following Him, we are showing it by being put under the water and we know that this is a sign of death. We give up who we were before and we come up out of the water, what? A new creation. Wonderful. This is what John was showing to the people. Repent and be baptized and then he called the people to follow Jesus with their whole heart and with their whole life. But then something happened that I don't think even John anticipated. Here was Jesus coming toward him. And when John recognized that it was Jesus, and it's not bore out in the scripture here in the Gospel of Mark, but all the other Gospels are touching on this story as well. In Matthew we read that John was saying about Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God. He was telling the people, This is the one who I've been telling you about. This is the Son of God. This is the Messiah who has come for you. And he wasn't shy to tell people to follow him rather than himself. He wasn't afraid to lose followers because they would follow Jesus now, because that was his whole aim. He was the voice in the wilderness that was crying out to the people to come and to follow Jesus, the one who was born among them, who would live before them, who would suffer in front of them, who would give his life for them, and who would be raised to death and ascend back to God. 
But now this Jesus, this Lamb of God, who John looked up to, came to John and said, I want you to baptize me. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine what went on in John's head? Again, in Matthew we read about that. Uh, he was saying something like, No, no, this is all wrong. I am in need to be baptized by you, Jesus, not you being baptized by me. He couldn't wrap his head, head around what Jesus was asking. He couldn't understand what was going on. But Jesus' reply to his question was simple. He said, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, he was saying to John, don't worry about that question. Leave it alone. Let it be. Just do what I'm asking you to do. And so I can imagine with fear and trembling, John took Jesus to the Jordan River. And just like all the other people who he had baptized, he baptized Jesus in the river. It's hard for us too to wrap our, hand, our, our heads around why Jesus was doing this. And I'm afraid I, I don't have a, an answer for you. I have maybe an idea or thoughts about it, but I don't know if that is the totality of the answer. But it was perhaps a way how Jesus wanted to fully identify with us as human beings, to show how much he loved us, that there was indeed nothing no thing that was too low or too humble for him to do as the Son of God. We're reminded of the words in Philippians 2 where Paul talks about the humbling, the making himself nothing of Jesus for our sakes. And I think that's what we see at least here partially in this story. Why did Jesus undergo this? Because to him it was another way how he fully identified with us his humanity that he had created. So after Jesus had said these things, John consented and baptized Jesus. And we are told in the scripture that as he came up out of the water, heaven opened up over Jesus and he saw the Spirit of God descending upon him like the dove, like a dove. And we know that the dove is oftentimes a picture of the peace of God, the Spirit of God. So it was a very special moment. I think it was a moment where his father honored him for being obedient to this point, of being willing to be identified with us humans in this even in this way even of being baptized and dying to himself like we were asked and are asked by John before and then after he saw the heaven open and the spirit of god descending upon him there was a voice from heaven that said this is my son in whom i am well pleased It doesn't say so, but I believe and think that these are the words of God the Father himself, voicing his pleasure over his son. He's saying, look at my son. I am so proud of him. I am so glad that he is the one who obeyed, who made himself nothing, who came to dwell among us. He is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now, Jesus exemplifies how we are to live in humble submission to God. We are asked to have the same attitude as Paul said in Philippians 2, the, the same attitude that Jesus had, who did not think it 
as something that he could hold on to and would want to hold on to, to be in the glory with his Father. Instead, he laid it down and he came to dwell among us. And he wants us as God's people to have that same attitude of humble submission to God. It shows the reckless kind of love that God has for us in His Son Jesus Christ. There's this modern songwriter who has a song that is entitled Reckless Love. We can't play it this morning, but I want to read some of the lyrics of that song. Maybe we'll post a link to that song on the Facebook site later on. Here it goes. He says, Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. <clears throat> Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it and I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I, when I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. There is no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb, coming after me. There is no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. It chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it and I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. What a description of godly, total, totally giving love for us that we see displayed uh, in Jesus, in his coming, in his submission to the will of God, in, and even in his submission to this baptism that he of all people wouldn't have needed because John's baptism was, as we have read, for the remission of sin. And we know that Jesus never committed any sin in his life. He was tempted, as the book of Hebrews tells us, like all of us, but without sin. And so we are seeing his great love displayed in this and we're seeing the great pleasure of his Father God displayed here, who is so well pleased in his Son. What can strike us though, is that how come God was telling Jesus that he was so well pleased? Remember at this point he had not engaged in any ministry. He was probably not known very well in the country of Israel not anything like he would be in a few more months or a few more years where his ministry had begun. He was probably known only as the son of Joseph who had been born under questionable circumstances. They had said that, yeah, the Holy Spirit had come upon Mary, but, uh, well, who believed that at that time? So he was, his birth was questionable. People would frown and and look at each other in ways that say, ah, yeah, we kind of know what was going on there. It was questionable. So Jesus had grown up as this questionable son of Joseph the carpenter. He probably grew up in the workshop of his father. He learned to, to do grunt work. He learned to build furniture. Maybe it was building houses <clears throat> and homes with his father. Think of it. The Son of God working in a dirty, dusty workshop from maybe his 14th year or even earlier to this very time. Jesus was not beneath anything that we have to do as human beings. He so completely identifies with us. His love is so great, so all-encompassing, so reckless that uh, 
He is willing to do anything and everything for us. But Jesus felt the expression of his Father's love before him, even before he had actually done what we call achievement, or had seen achievement, had seen success, had seen people healed, had lame people walk, had seen deaf ears opened, or where he had done miracles like made water into wine. Nothing of that had yet happened, and yet God expressed his pleasure over his son. And I think that is very instructive for us as well. There is a story of Edward Farrell, a priest from Detroit who was visiting his uncle in Ireland, who was about to celebrate his 80th birthday. And on this day, they got up early to walk to a lake, <coughs> excuse me, observing the sunrise. And they stood side by side for about 20 minutes in, at this lake, observing the sunrise from behind the mountains. And Ed looked at his uncle's face and saw it had broken into a broad smile. So Ed asked his uncle and said, Uncle Seamus, you are looking very happy. So Uncle Seamus answered, yes I am. How come? Ed asked him. His uncle replied, the father of Jesus is very fond of me. Now that may strike you as an odd statement, but I think in this moment, taken in by the beauty of their surroundings, knowing that this was all created by their maker, he experienced something similar to what Jesus experienced here in the baptism. He felt the pleasure of God around him. He felt that he was enveloped by the love of God. He hadn't done anything. He hadn't achieved anything. He didn't need to show success of what had occurred before in his life. No, his love, the love of God, was so evident in the scene before them that he could say, the Father of Jesus is very fond of me. And you want, know what? I can say with authority, the Father of Jesus is very fond of each and every one of us. He loves us. It's visible in how he gave himself. It's visible in how he lived before us, how he taught us. We have to come to this place where we really see that God loves us, that he likes us, that we don't have to do things to be liked and loved by him. He embraces us the way we are. And if we see that, then we will see where there is lack in us and where he wants to cleanse us from things that may be wrong and need to be changed. But his love is always there before we ever dare to change. He loves us because he is there, he is kind. It's just his nature. He embraces us. And so we can hear the words that Jesus heard today spoken to us by our Father in Heaven, who is saying, This is my son, this is my daughter, in whom I am well pleased. And then we embrace what the Lord wants us to do. Then we embrace what He may have us be involved in, and walk <clears throat> with Him to see His name glorified in us and around us. We are part of the family of Christ by embracing that Jesus loves us, that God loves us, that He speaks over us, that we are His beloved sons and daughters. Let's pray. Father, we give honor to You for showing us in your Son, Jesus Christ, that we, like him, are your beloved sons and daughters. There's never anything that we can do to make you love us more. 
There's never anything that we can do that make you love us less. So as we stand here, we want to embrace and welcome that truth in our life. And because of that love, we can be changed where changing is necessary, where we have done things that are displeasing to you. We welcome your presence and we say with the act of baptism that we have died to our old life, to our old self. We have gone into the water one person and we have come up out of the water a new person, a new creation. And now we walk with you, we follow you, we step in your footsteps, we learn from you, we train with you, and we experience your love as we submit ourselves to you. And we are enabled to train and reign with you in the places that you have given to us, wherever that may be, in schools, in our jobs, in our daily lives, in our raising of our families. You have given us a place where you want us to live out the life that you have given us, this new life. So we stand this morning before you, honoring you for your love for us, that is indescribable, that is reckless, that uh, in many ways doesn't make any sense because we all know deep down we don't deserve it, but yet you give it to us. So thank you, Lord. We bless you, we praise you, we honor you, we say you are worthy. Amen. We'll have uh, one more song that we'll play, and it's a song that is actually led by a worship leader, and there is a response by the singers. And as you listen, you can see that yourself and enter into giving answers to it. The song is taken from scripture from the book of Revelation, where it talks about who is worthy, who is worthy, and the answer is, it is Jesus, the Lamb of God, who we saw laying down his life in these words that we saw this morning. He is worthy.
with your love. We thank you that you came to dwell among us, to pitch your tent, your TV among us, to move into our neighborhood, to show us how to live, to show us how to die, to show us how we are to be your witness in this world. But most of all, we're grateful that you removed the distance that separated us from your Father, our sin. We thank you that we are in your presence because of what you have done. We thank you that our baptism reminds us that we have been washed, that we are no longer the same than we were before. We thank you that you are with us today, even in uncertain times. We know that your love and your care and your presence surrounds us. We thank you that you are our good shepherd who leads us to give us everything that we need. Everything. We thank you that even when our ways lead through dark and difficult places, you are with us. Even in the face of greatest troubles, you prepare a table for us. And Lord, your goodness, your mercy, your loving kindness is following after us, is pursuing us relentlessly. Your reckless love never lets us go. You are indeed worthy. We stand in awe of you, and we give you praise with all of our hearts. Even as we depart from here this morning, we ask that you and the grace of you, our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit will be with us all. <clears throat>